been specifically kind of concentrating on um, more conventional advertising mediums, um, just because there's a lot of stuff out there. If you want to learn about um, internet marketing, how to use Google AdWords, and things like that, um, maybe um, we'll have uh, Heather hey, back in for another uh, session. Nice, hey. Uh, hello. Hi, guys. Um, so, a uh, little background about Kate before we get started. Um, we're totally donation-based. We've been going since the beginning of this year, so that makes this our 25th. 29th week, but 25th session, I think. Yeah, um, which is awesome. We're super uh, organized. And uh, yeah, we're we're very organized, as you can tell. Um, and uh, it's the the main purpose in starting this was just to actually give people a lot of down and dirty, um, almost like business hacks uh, or really useful information they can just immediately put to use to improve the business, um, as opposed to kind of some more ethereal, up in the air, sort of vague business um, strategy or ethos. Um, actually just providing things that people can use. And um, Portland just is so friendly to small business as well. Um, also just focusing on things you can actively do around our community to, um, to make it work. So um, that's it. We are totally donation-based, so feel free to toss in any money into the box. And we have a donate online button via PayPal um, if you're watching online or just watching this video archived. Um, you know, even 5 to $10 always helps. Um, like I said, today we're going to be talking about ads, and I have a little outline here, so if I glance down at my technological iPad here, don't be offended. Um, so, uh, the main thing I wanted to get across today is just how to get actual value out of your ads, and especially like if you see a print ad in a newspaper, in a magazine, or something like that, um, what's actually going on, you know, why companies invest so much money in those, why you might want to or might not want to, and if you decide to go actual print advertising route, uh, what to do with that. And um, so my main things that I think print advertising gets done, um, or radio advertising, or even just a lot of banner advertising, anything like that, is um, giving people actual value. Like if you give them something they can actually use, or are teaching them a lesson, or give them something that's useful rather than just like shouting at them. Um, providing additional vi visibility for an existing brand. Um, so like Coca-Cola takes out giant billboards and stuff, not because people need to find out what Coca-Cola is about, which is the struggle that as a small business you probably have, but because, because it's just a reminder that they exist. And for them being such a big company, just having this big billboard says like, yes, we still exist and we're doing well. Like, look, we can afford advertising everywhere and it just becomes this ubiquitous, just kind of, we're out there thing. Um, tying into your overall story, um, because you're using an ad, it doesn't mean that you need to like make some kind of crazy advertising campaign. You can actually tie into your marketing that you're doing anyway and make sure that it works with the story of your company and not just like your company decided to take out an ad, but like you're actually making a statement with what you're saying in your ad and how you're using it. And then um, also the ability to um, actually just buy yourself a column or a radio spot or something like that is something that I think is the most useful form of um, conventional advertising that gets really overlooked. Is just um, by buying a like weekly quarter page ad in a paper, you can actually just buy yourself a column that you change every week. Or by buying yourself a 30 second news spot on the radio, you can buy yourself a weekly news spot that you update every week and just announce something new about like, um, I first heard this when I was listening to uh, business podcasts way back in the day, and the example he used was um, he was doing a stock analyst company and giving people stock advice and trying to get people to sign up for his stock newsletter. And so he took out a, um, a weekly radio spot where every week he'd just do this um, like minute-long ad, basically, and give advice on the best, best stocks to buy. And then, you know, announce his website afterwards, which is great, because like, it's giving someone immediately useful information um, it's putting it in the medium where people are expecting to get that kind of information back. And then he's just kind of tossing in the advertisement as a second thought, um, which is awesome. So those are kind of the, uh, the things that I'm going to get to using. And before that, I wanted to give just a little history of advertising because I think it gives a lot of um, context for where we are right now and also um, informs a lot of my actual advice for what you should do strategy-wise. Um, so we talked a little bit about this uh, during one of our previous sessions, which you can look up online, um, which is the uh, marketing segments and how to segment your market um, kind of section. But that was mainly geared towards market research. And uh, so it ties similarly back in, but um, Egyptians and uh, Egyptians using papyrus uh, way back in the day, um, even in like uh, Pompeii and Arabia, we found like weird archived uh, forms of billboards or uh, other advertising that was put up around, which is really crazy. Um, but yeah, Egyptians and papyrus paper, kind of like the first forms of pamphlets that got handed out, like that actually seemed to be selling something. Um, and so, like, fast forward from that, where you kind of have a very similar thing. You have town criers um, announcing things. You have just signs out in front of a business. 
And um, Middle Ages, as uh, towns and cities begin to actually grow to a decent size, uh, you had people who were practicing different crafts. You had blacksmiths, and you had people who were like making arrows, and you had people who were running taverns. Um, only uh, people couldn't read back then. Uh, at least it was very uncommon. And so along with those services that you started seeing offered, you had uh, little emblems up there, like the blacksmith is, you know, a hammer or a shield or a sword or whatever it happens to be. And you have kind of the birth of logos as well going along with advertising. It just stems back to this time when you had very trade skills that people could not um, actually read a sign for. Um, <clears throat> around the 18th century, like, you know, after the, well, after the printing press and, um, kind of into the Industrial Revolution, uh, you start to see advertisements appear in uh, newspapers, which is interesting. And then uh, 1836 was the first kind of push towards that. And there was this uh, French newspaper called La Presse. And uh, it was the first one to really start to bring in significant advertising um, revenue and to place ads to supplement its readership money that was coming in. And as a result, it charged its readers less money and was able to increase its circulation, get more money from advertisers, and other papers were like, oh. Like, I see where this is going, and then, so that's where actually, like, 1836 is where you actually start to see advertising sponsoring um, messages, or sponsoring this news, or sponsoring whatever information you, um, that people want. Um, 1840, a guy named uh, Volney Palmer uh, established the uh, first kind of ad agency, which is interesting, um, only he was more of, like, an ad buyer and reseller. So he'd just buy up crazy amounts of ads in these new newspapers that were offering all this ad space and resell it to other shops around at an increased rate, and that's how he'd make his money. Um, early 1900s, uh, or uh, sorry, late 1800s, um, you start to see the actual first advertising uh, companies, and that was um, Iyer and Son was the, uh, was the name of that one. And that was the first one that was actually, you had someone, you're giving them your product and they're just doing all of the creative work and developing the ads and making it its own industry. And so that's really where the birth of the advertising industry came around. Um, 1887, just as a little another uh, landmark to toss in there, that's where we had the first coupons. That was uh, Asa Chandler from Coca-Cola uh, had the first uh, coupons. So if you ever wondering where coupons came from, Coca-Cola launched the very first ones and theirs were for a free uh, bottle or a free drink of Coca-Cola. Um, and it was estimated they had, I think, like several million um, users of that coupon within like 10 or 20 years of them, which is crazy for back in the day. Um, so that's pretty much like, yeah, they took this uh, like not very well-known tonic, and that's how Coca-Cola got on the map, was through the, like inventing coupons. Um, the uh, 1900s, you see uh, radio and TV, and you start to see sponsorship coming in. And um, at this point, companies, it's kind of an early form of this, so companies are sponsoring whole programs. Um, and you might remember things like the Twilight Zone, where you actually have episodes sponsored and like the program sponsored by a single person. You know, you have um, the host up there actually smoking the cigarettes that he's trying to sell. Um, and things have just recently started moving back in this direction, which is really interesting and something to pay attention to. And we'll get to that after kind of this little summary. Um, the 1950s is where you see a break from that. And the Dumont Television Network is the first people to uh, launch ad ads um, that are multiple ads for a single show. Um, realizing that they can get significantly more money by charging multiple people less to fund the actual show that they're making. And other television uh, networks saw that and were like, okay, great, um, and hopped right on board. Um, before that, you actually saw the same thing in radio, um, just a little earlier, maybe five years earlier, radio started doing it and then television hopped on board. Um, late 1950s, early 1960s, you start to, start to see um, heavy spending in mass media channels, and you start to see um, advertising not going for sponsoring a single show, but for like sponsoring a show here, taking ads out in these papers, getting a radio spot here. Um, you start to see kind of this um, reaching all points kind of media contact going on. Um, 80s and 90s, you see the media actually becoming um, important to the ads. So you actually, like, uh, most important thing that happened then was MTV, and MTV comes out. And suddenly, rather than having ads that are on a place where people are watching content, the content becomes the things that they're selling. And the music videos that they're putting up there are the from the artists of the albums that they're tossing out. And from there, you see a development into, yeah, the Home Shopping Channel, the Food Network Channel, the, like, a million other things like that, where the actual content is exactly what they're selling, which is a nice development. Um, Satellite television, yeah, just totally takes advantage of that and blasts uh, the world's so now you have 200 channels <laughs> and a heart of the message of whatever it is that you're buying. Um, and then, of course, you hit um, the internet age, which we're getting more and more familiar with. 
Um, but the ad server was really the beginning of that, which is where you get to serve up um, different ads on different websites and kind of track who's coming through. The earliest versions were just kind of pay per um, how many displays you have, because that's the easiest thing to track with the technology back then. So we will display this ad a thousand times on this website, and you give us money. And you started seeing that develop, um, which is basically taking print advertising and modifying it for the web. And then we started developing web technology and we realized it's this whole different ball game. We can start um, concentrating on what people are actually searching for and targeting our ads to them. And you start seeing Google AdWords come around. Um, and then you see social media come around and social media advertising. Um, and so the interesting thing is that in the scope of who you could reach and why you're trying to do advertising in the first place, and this is the thesis of a lot of what I'll be saying throughout the rest of this, is you, um, you went from this age where, I mean, even back in the Egyptians, you had people handing out pamphlets, which is crazy, because you think about living in a small or even large Egyptian, Egyptian city with people, and you're not talking about living in a million population in Portland or anything like that, right? Like, handing out pamphlets um, really was more a sign that you were serious about something. Like, yes, so we, like, made this papyrus and had someone, like, write out this crazy message about something that we think you want, and it's sort of this personal message to someone. Um, and as we got more of that uh, technology developed, we entered into a really impersonal era of advertising, um, but where people weren't savvy to it. So you actually had just giant billboards announcing things, but we weren't used to seeing billboards around. And kind of the effectiveness of each new advertising medium goes down the more that we get used to being shoved at from it. And the interesting thing recently, I think, is that we've gone back to more of this um, recommendation system, more of um, old school, um, not even like Egyptians, but even fast forward to like the 13, 1400s, where you went to the blacksmith either because they were the only one in town, or because you lived in a big enough city where you ask like the person with the nicest sword where they got their sword done, and they're like, oh, freaking Phil, down at the blacksmith's shop, like he's the only one I'd trust with my sword when I'm out fighting the barbarian hordes that raid our city, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, with Facebook we see that a lot more, and so we see a lot of movement away from advertising too, and just now, especially print advertising, things that aren't immediately traceable and as immediately changeable as internet advertising. I think, what, was it this year, Derek, you know, that it just passed? Um, internet and print advertising? Like last like, year. Yeah, last year, yeah. Um, really recently, which is crazy, um, that print advertising is still doing so well. If you look at phone book sales too, just like for advertising space in phone books, it's incredible um, how much those are still just pulling in, like they're going down, but it's still just a cash cow. It's completely absurd. Um, well, another part of that is because everything that's not online is integrated online. So you have magazine ads that say, find us on Facebook. You have television ads that say, use this app to find out more about this song. So everything's kind of linking back and forth. So that's kind of one of the reasons it's eclipsed. Definitely, definitely. Um, so I think the best thing you can do with advertising now, which we'll get into kind of how and your different uh, mediums of doing, this is just a little background, so you can actually like prove my point um, a little more, back it up, um, which is moving towards that conversational side. And um, what you want to do now with advertising is less be um, shouting out to people or putting something out there that people are going to see and treat as actually weighty, because now people know that all you do to get an ad is pay for it. Um, they don't think that you have some magical, like, special power to get in a newspaper and it's like the newspaper's actually recommending you. Um, or like the person on the TV show that you watch is actively, like, eating your breath mints and saying, I eat these breath mints and they're the best and you should too. Like, that's not how ads are done now, you know, you get this little 30 second slot or whatever it is. Um, but you can treat them that way. And you can move them more back towards that region. Um, and I think that's what gets reward now, rewarded nowadays in advertising is the more you go back to this conversational, recommendational, um, and most of all, the more you can provide actual value or actual information. And so let's talk a little bit about what that looks like in the scheme of a few different uh, types uh, of ads or contexts that you place them in. So um, of course there's print. Um, and just to kind of give a little overview of different ways, like this is a short list of places you have to, to do ads. So um, newspapers, magazines, zines, which are popular around Portland, um, posters, brochures, these are going to be the most common things that you'd say. I'd add on business cards to that as well, any printed material basically that you're doing. Um, even down to legal agreements that you have people sign, I think are great advertising slots. And one of the things I want to do with um, Float On is actually move towards any contracts that we have, have just a really simple like plain text explanation at the very beginning, and then go into like the contract portion with all of the legalese. Um, just because that seems like a really nice way to show anyone who signs a contract with us that we're also a reasonable company. Um, but literally anything that you print out that's going to go to multiple sources is an ad. Like you just might not realize it or actually be taking advantage of that. Um, 
Online, we have, of course, search engines, the AdWords, Google, Yahoo Search, Bing, things like that. Um, social networks, things like Facebook and Twitter. Um, Facebook, of course, you can actually now buy ads in and have their whole ad system set up. Craigslist, free ads anywhere in the world, pretty much. Um, there's blogs, who even if Fiat blogs don't have any ads on them or sell them, those are actually the easiest to get ads on. And you just email them and say like, hey, blogger who I really like reading, can I pay you like 50 bucks a month and get an ad on your site? And they'll be like, yeah, you're gonna just like pay me money. And if they don't have an ad up there, I guarantee it's probably the first time they've been offered that or they're really big and you'll never get on them anyway. Um, <laughs> Apps now too. A lot of um, apps in the uh, App Store, both for Android and for um, for the iPhone, are funded via ads. And you'll see a free app or a 99 cent app. And where they're really making money is from ads of people who want to reach their customers, which could be you. Um, daily deals are also an interesting source of ad that actually brings in revenue, um, which is the way that I prefer to think of it, rather than something that brings in customers. Um, and also happens to like send out an email blast. Is it's like this great source of hitting an email list and advertising getting up on a website, and also it happens to bring in money and customers and rather than costing you that much yourself. Um, and those you have Groupon, Living Social, Google Offers, Yelp, and Amazon Local, I think are the main ones that you'd want to hit up. And um, you can go back and watch this video if I tore through that list too fast. Um, but those aren't that important, and we're not going to talk about them too much in this. So. Um, Let's go back kind of to what I was saying earlier about the main things I wanted to get across, that kind of purpose and implementation, what you can actually give people. So giving people value um, is a really big one. And considering their context, I think helps a ton with that. Like, it's just essential. So when you're thinking about what value you can give people, it's like, oh, great. Like, I'm going to, you know, if, um, the best example I have that uh, I ever saw was just I went to a website on dog food. And it was just this guy who on his website had a video ad where he talks, and I've talked about this before in cages because I love it so much, it's just like two minutes of him talking about the dog food industry and what goes into normal dog food and how he did his better and like what makes it made his good for, um, you know, actually caring for your dog. And it was great, like afterwards I was convinced. I was just like, okay, great, I don't own a dog. I just watched your two minute video because it was so freaking good. And if I ever do have a dog, I'm gonna buy your dog food. Um, but providing actual education about not only your product, but about the industry as a whole, so that people have a criteria with which to judge you in a context. Um, because big companies are all about cutting corners and taking advantage of the fact that people don't know the industry and they don't know how to choose quality products. So the more you can educate them, the more they know why your small, locally run thing is more expensive than this big one. Um, and to do that, considering context um, is the first step. So um, I'll give an example of this on the uh, handout that I'll be giving out for this. Um, we talked about this earlier during one of the cake sessions too, but I think Craigslist is a really good starting point to understand the idea of context. Um, <clears throat> so your typical Craigslist ad looks like, um, like let's just take um, a car mechanic or something he's posting on Craigslist. And he says, hey, I'm a great mechanic. I've been in business for 15 years. You know, um, I li like I'm right in this area. I'm really convenient for getting freeway access. Everyone loves me, and I charge this much an hour, which is a lot cheaper than you find other places, hire me. And that's like your typical Craigslist ad you find for anything. Um, better than that is to actually teach them something. So if you're a mechanic, say like, hey, just so you know, like I'm this local mechanic in town, here's how you do your own oil change. And like, here's a little video of me doing it, and in Portland, here's the places where you can distribute your oil around, and also like contact me if you need any other mechanical work done. And like that to me is way better because you're giving someone something useful and you're proving that you know your stuff instead of just saying it. It's kind of like that show, not tell kind of thing. Um, way better than that even is to say like, okay, so people are going to Craigslist and the realization, like the jump kind of from that, that first one, the standard thing, like, hey, buy my service to like, hey, let me teach you something and also maybe buy my service, um, is the realization of why people are there, which is they're there because they want to find a mechanic, they probably want to save a little money, and they want to know that they're like going to also, despite the fact of choosing a mechanic on Craigslist, choose someone who knows their stuff. So actually teaching someone something shows them that and qualifies you from the other Craigslist listings. Um, but really, this like the, what they don't even realize they're looking for at the time they hop on that first Craigslist landing page is they're like confronted with this giant list of just mechanics. And what they really want to know at that point is how do I choose the best mechanic from this list? So really what your Craigslist ad should be is how to choose a good mechanic, advice from someone who's been in the industry for 15 years. And then at the very end of telling them how to go through Craigslist and choose the best mechanic from all the listings they have, you give your information. 
And that's like just kind of like the depth you can go into figuring out the context of what people want to know. And the more you can give them that immediate information that answers their question, the better your ad is going to be. The more you're shouting at them, like, we're really smart now. We walk down the street all the time. We see billboards and we like see Craigslist listings and we see spam email all the time. Like, without providing someone something useful and actually actively showing it, like, you're just screwed and you're going to waste money on advertising. Um, and the exception to this is the people who are really well known and getting more of a buzz around, in which case that advertising they see is just another point of contact. It's just something else for someone to be like, oh, that sign reminds me of this company I already know about. Like, let me tell you about the passenger in the car. Um, and those can work too, but if you're trying to just start out and just get your name known, um, that sort of advertising is not going to really do anything from you. And that's from experience and from talking to a lot of other people who've run local businesses too. Most people who take out advertising in newspapers see no return from it and actually lose money on it. Um, and my opinion is that that's actively because they do not provide this extra value on top of it. They're just shouting at people. Um, so getting that brand visibility, um, this is interesting. This is something we're just starting to maybe transfer to with Float On, um, with our float tanks, because we're just starting to get to the point where most people I talk to now actually know what float tanks are and have even heard of our company, um, which is a big step. Uh, and that means we're actually considering now getting a billboard um, just up on Hawthorne and kind of leading to our business, which is another one. You know, make sure like if you are going to be in a high visibility area, you're like actually targeting people who could be your customers. So like right along Hawthorne is a good spot. But more than directing people immediately there, I think that people love us enough and we have a high enough ratings and high enough user feedback and great word of mouth that if someone sees a giant float on billboard, they're just stoked for us. And they're like, oh, float on got a billboard? Great. <laughs> like, and then whoever they're in the car with is like, oh, those guys, you've got to try this out. And is immediately reminded. And it's just this nice area that, yeah, that lives in their brain where they get a little cue from us every once in a while from seeing an ad around town. Um, so we'll see how that goes. I haven't actually actively tested that out, but that's kind of my theory is you hit a certain point of awareness where then... Um, print advertising or billboard advertising actually does start to work again. And that's sort of a recent theory I have going, so I'll, I'll update you guys on how that goes. Um, oops, left my notes. Um, advertorials are another good way to think about this context and where people want to reach you. So outside of that Craigslist example, um, think about why people are going to the different spots that they are. So in a newspaper, they're going there because they want interesting content or they want to know something to do like it, those are pretty much the two things that I found from or they want to learn something I guess is maybe a third one um, so depending on what publication it is that's exactly what you should do with your content um, pass around a little example ad so we started taking out ads in the uh, mercury um, for we called them uh, tales from the tanks and essentially what we were doing was buying ourselves a column if you want to pass these around really quick um, so rather than uh, take out an ad that uh, just said like, hey, float on, we're located at 45th and Hawthorne, and here's our location, uh, you know, here's our prices, get a 10% discount from seeing this ad or whatever it is, um, we started doing a um, weekly changing Tales from the Tanks where um, we had people write out their um, stories of their time spent in float tanks and we had a little like competition that we post online and uh, they'd submit their tales, and then it would give the person we actually published a free float, so you get this extra little, extra little um, tie-in. Like I said, if you tie it into your broad story and your other marketing campaigns, then print things get that much more effective. Um, but the nice thing is, we even um, customized the font so that it looks like the headlines from the Mercury, and the text is the same text size as you see in the Mercury. Um, and when uh, people came in to float on, even though it said uh, paid advertising right above our column, people said, oh, I really like your column in the Mercury. You know, like they don't say like, oh, I like saw your ad and that's why I came in here. It's like, oh, you're calling. Um, and that works great. And that's called the advertorial style, um, which I highly recommend. Like that's the most, e the easiest way to make it context specific. If you're in a newspaper, try to match the font, try to match the headers, try to match everything else, like the byline, um, and just buy your own column. Um, if you get a radio spot, like I said earlier with the stock thing, buy your own radio spot and just actually give useful information like it was a real, uh, real story. Um, and that's way better than buying an ad that is the same every single week and you just have this place, you're actually providing real value for people. Um, and once again, they don't treat it as an advertisement. Like, because you are so tuned in to their context, they feel like it's just part of the paper. And like, it actually does also give you that um, air of authority and makes you an expert in whatever realm. Like, oh, you're doing a column in the paper about this subject every single week? Um, gives you that extra boost as well. Um, What are they doing when they see your ad? What state of mind are they in? What do they want? 
and what can you give them? Just as a little reminder here, midstream, are the questions that I ask myself, and that'll be on this little handout that I provide as well. Um, also a reminder, um, go back and just check out our checklist um, on cakepdx.com for uh, good copy um, techniques. And uh, you'll find a worksheet in the resources section, um, which is how to write good copy. And once you want to know what to put into your actual ad or into your advertorial, um, that's a really good, you can just go down, I think it's like a 10 point checklist and it tells you everything from um, establishing expertise to call to action to yeah, everything you need to throw in there to actually make a really good ad. Um, so definitely go back and check that out before you go and make your own. Um, also, um, consider too, and this isn't tied directly into ads, but is much more the cake way. Um, so this uh, presentation on ads is really interesting just because cake is all about being scrappy and not paying for advertising, things like that. Um, so think also of PR events as um, advertising, which is um, pretty much what Float On does. We haven't paid so far, despite getting a bunch of ads in the Mercury, for any of it. We've either done it all through trade, or um, we get news articles just by putting on events and doing really creative things and sending out um, big PR press kits for it. Um, but uh, just from sending out one um, press kit to a bunch of different publications around town, um, we got a two-page spread in the Mercury, we got the cover of it, um, we got a two-page spread in the Yatney Reader, which is the national one, we got um, postings in pretty much all the local ones, at least like a small little square in the Willamette Week, in like the Northeast or Southeast Examiner, um, a bunch of different things around. We got named like um, a new business of the year in a magazine I'd never heard of called uh, New Awakenings, um, which we randomly sent out to, yeah. Um, which is great, and um, that all just came from doing a program where we gave two free floats to artists and had them do artwork afterwards, made a press kit about the entire thing and sent it out, and as a result, we pretty much just traded those services for giant front pages and huge two-page spreads, which cost thousands and thousands of dollars if you actually pay for advertising. Um, but more and more, doing cool things is also the way to get in there, and you don't have to pay for it if you can actually convince people to cover you. And I'd be remiss as, you know, one of the cake runners if I didn't mention that as the main source that you should have for your advertising is just, like, increasing your product and, like, making it better and doing cool things around town and telling people about it and sending out these press releases also just gets you in papers and you don't have to pay for it. Um, okay, and we're down to the end now. I was just kind of scanning through to see if there's anything I missed. Um, so, that said, there are interesting ways around Portland to get free advertising as well. Um, Merc Perks is a really good one if you guys don't know about that. And um, I think everyone should take advantage of this, which I don't know if you'll love me or hate me, Mercury, for shooting out that message. Um, but it's a great program. It was started before Groupon um, ever launched, and it's very, sim very similar to Groupon. And basically, you provide your service or your good or whatever it is for 50% off to Mercury readers, and then they give you the full value of your good in advertising credit. Um, so, for example, we sold 250 floats on Merkberg, so just gave away 250. Um, and they made, I think, $6,250 from that. Um, so $25 per float for the 250. And then um, we made, uh, or sorry, six, yeah, 6250 And then we made $12,500 in advertising credit with them, um, which is enough to buy our Tales from the Tanks for half a year, for 26 weeks of getting a quarter page column of Tales from the Tanks in there. Um, so not only, and we, we sold out in three days, too, which they told us it was going to trickle out over months, I guess usually that's how it works, so the readers just love us, which we found out, too. Um, but it also told them that, which made them way more likely to just kind of work with us and cover us. They're like, oh, our readers love you guys. Um, we get immediate, ad immediate advertising from their customers coming in from buying the deal, and then we get all of this money to spend on ads. So if you ever want to, like, cut your chops on advertising, just try out new things, um, that's a great way to go about it, is this Merc Perk system, and all you have to do is donate some of your goods. Um, Thrill List is an event listing um, program around town. Um, they're also national, they list all over in different cities. Um, but they, we've done barter with them for floats for listing different events that we've been doing. They just give away a couple of passes to those events or floats and things like that to their customers. Um, so yeah, you can do barter with Thrill List to get listed um, for events around town. Um, once again, Craigslist is great. Um, for especially early market testing, which we've talked about in lots of the early, um, early cakes, but uh, just going on there, like if you want to try a headline that you're going to then run as a print ad or want to try something that you want to run as a print ad, try it on Craigslist first and try like five different variations and put a little counter on and see what gets the most click throughs. That way, if you actually are spending money on the print ad, you at least have this free testing period where you got to refine it and didn't end up wasting your money. You actually know what people are interested in. It's a really good testing ground. Um, and uh, the last thing I'll say about putting your, um, your information out there is 
unless you really are one of those big companies and all you want to do is generate more awareness and make sure that you are actually out there and being seen and kind of keep this buzz going, make sure it's trackable. And um, that's one of the reasons, too, other than getting people in to buy free Coca-Cola, that coupons were widely, widely used in the early days, was simply to see where people came from. So if someone comes in with the coupon code that you solely put on your Mercury ad, you know they came from the Mercury. If you, someone comes in from your print ad that you put in the Willamette Week, you know they came from the Willamette Week. Someone came from the code that you had on your Google AdWords, they came from there. Um, basic stuff, you've been running print ads for a while, but just glancing through like the Mercury and the Willamette Week, the amount of ads that don't have any coupon code or don't have any way to trace them is absurd. Like, how are you going to tell if you're wasting money or if it's actually being spent wisely if you don't have some way to track the traffic that's coming in from it? Um, you're just basically tossing money blindly out there and like any random thing that happens that increases or decreases your traffic you can account for with that ad. So it's essentially just saying like, I don't care. Like I do not care what the result of this is, but I will buy it um, if you don't throw a tracker on there. Um, and so I wanted to, I meant to print out a lot of these, but it looks like I only did one. Um, but uh, you can kind of take a look at, at this or pass it around during the break too. Um, so we just recently took out the most kind of um, pure print ad that we've done for Float On, and this is going on the um, back of, there's a, a new Reader's Choice issue of the Mercury coming out, um, and this is going on the back of there. Um, and you can kind of take a look at it. So this is basically for that ad, um, rather than do an advertorial, something like that, um, we took uh, it being Reader's Choice, considering context, right? We're like, okay, what do people want from a Reader's Choice ad? Um, they probably want to, know where to go around town that other people love that they haven't checked out yet. Um, and so this ad is just completely uh, taking reviews that we've had from around Google, from around Yelp, from uh, issues um, of like the Mercury of the Etni Reader that we got published in, putting quotes there, um, showing our overall rating from different places, and basically just saying like, we rock. And also you get 20% off your float if you come in. There's definitely a Mercury appropriate quote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that we can trace it. Um, and the nice thing is, so that's like, if someone's going through the Reader's Choice Guide, hopefully it just gets left around on a bunch of different surfaces and people can see the back page. We tried an ad in a Mercury in the middle of one of the guides, and I'm convinced no one came in from it. It's like, we're like, okay, we're just going to spring for the back cover next time, see how that works. Um, unfortunately, people know exactly how it works, because I put that little 20% off code at the bottom. So as soon as anyone takes advantage of that, we'll be able to track it over the next few months and actually see how many people are coming in from that too and compare it against our internal ad and compare it against our other methods and see if this is like worth doing in the future, if maybe we should stick with our tails from the tanks for our Merck Perks money, um, stuff like that. And so, uh, yeah, that's a little insight both into how Flowdown has been running its ads and what I think are some best practices and also just why I think they're best practices and why I think things are moving more towards this um, conversational, try to do advertorial, not just doing a straight ad for your business style, um, as they have been working in the past. Um, so thanks very much, guys, for listening to all of that. <laughs> and um, yeah, hopefully the stream continues live throughout the entire thing. Nice. Um, and once again, we're totally donation-based, so feel free to toss in some money. And we'll take a little 10, 15-minute break right here, and then come back afterwards for the workshop portion, hand out some more information, and uh, get sure, that going thanks. as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, guys.